God's time is the best. Go to church. Stop wasting your time. Don't let the devil tempt you unnecessary. Shogbo, are you listening? Her mother's tenderness was always delivered with a healthy backhand of realism. Kemi would automatically nod at each passing statement. Hello and welcome to another edition of the On Air Book Club podcast. My name is Titilayo Oyinson. And if you're meeting me for the first time, I need to tell you something. I'm in love with books. I love reading books. I love just the feel of books. I love flipping through the pages and finding myself going down the rabbit hole into different worlds, visiting different countries, building or rebuilding new opportunities just within the covers of a book. We have an amazing piece with us today, and it's titled, In Every Mirror, She's Black, written by Lola Akimade Akastrom. So this particular book happened to fall in my lap. And uh, when a book falls in your lap, you have one of two choices. Ignore it or just flip through it. And yes, when I got the opportunity to flip through this particular piece, I was pleasantly surprised. Now, I have had the opportunity to meet Lola uh, beforehand and her boisterous personality tells you so much once you meet her. She's full of energy, but not just that. She's essentially very, very accomplished. Let me give you a little more insight into Lola. Uh, Now, she's a Nigerian-American based in Sweden. She's an award-winning author, speaker, and photographer. Now, her work has appeared in National Geographic, BBC, CNN, Guardian, Sunday Times Travel, The Daily Telegraph, New York Times, Travel and Leisure, and many, many more. In addition to contributing to several books, she's the author of the Lowell Thomas Award 2018 Award winner for Best Travel Book, Due North, and the best-selling Lagom, Swedish Secret of Living Well. Hmm. Now, it might interest you to know that that particular book is available in 18 foreign language editions, which just gives you a little insight into how accomplished she is. I have to say a big thank you to her for stepping into the studio with us today. Thank you so much. So excited to be here and thanks for having me. Now, let's look into some praise for the book In Every Mirror, She's Black. This book is a wise and complicated exploration of the lives of three black women in America and Sweden. Lola offers a sharply written story with messy, deeply moving characters, raising brutal questions and steering clear of easy answers. A book that will stick with you long after you've turned the last page. This was written by Taylor Jenkins Reid, the New York Times bestselling author of Daisy Jones and the Six. Let me see what else we have here. Hmm. Okay, in her debut novel, Lola has given us a story that is at once enjoyable and disturbing as it explores the painful price millions of women around the world pay for walking around with black skin. Mbolo Mbwe, the New York Times best-selling author of Behold the Dreamers. Now, there's so much for us to talk about. Yes. But I think the best thing for us would be to delve into the book. Let's begin. In Every Mirror, She's Black. Written by Lola Akimade Akerstrom. Passage Theme, Chapter 1, Kemi, Page 9. As read by Titilayo Oinson. America had decimated Kemi's love life. It had shredded her dignity and tossed its slivers into the air, cackling like a hyena. Relegated to picking up questionable prospects, Kemi was tired of wearing her invisible armor. A two-ton defense system that screamed to the world she didn't need a man. She couldn't carry that weight anymore. Lately, her dating life read like a dossier of shame. First, There was that one memorable dinner with Deepak. I think I told you I'm a software developer, right? Deepak began to overdose on his own voice 20 minutes in. Kemi simply stared at him. She figured him name-dropping his career the sixth time wasn't worth a verbal response. 
The rest of the evening, Deepak intermittently punctuated his monologues with his love for black booty. Then there was the silent date with Earl, a white accountant from Ohio who summoned visions of a serial killer. Earl kept staring into nothingness past her face. Each time he tried glancing her way, his hawk eyes floated down her cleavage, then darted back into the intriguing void beyond her. She wasn't sure if he was shy or scheming. And how could she forget the Jamaican real estate agent, Devon, whose gaze kept trailing every white woman that sauntered past their table while professing unflinching love for the sisters? America had stretched Kemi's limits and run her resolve through an involuntary boot camp. According to every dating survey she had ever read, she, a black African woman, was the least desirable relationship prospect alongside Asian men. Those surveys said the first choice was someone else. This verdict chipped away at Kemi, carving and presenting a weaker version of herself that received every suitor through a skeptical lens of paranoia. Yet, like a gluten for punishment, she kept going back to the app that faithfully failed her with precision. Don't worry, my dear. Her mother's drawl would float abruptly into her stream of consciousness whenever she found herself swiping faces left or right on her iPhone. Then it would taper off into a miniature sermon, followed by a reprimand. God's time is the best. Go to church. Stop wasting your time. Don't let the devil tempt you unnecessary. Shogwa, are you listening? Her mother's tenderness was always delivered with a healthy backhand of realism. Kemi would automatically nod at each passing statement, knowing full well her mother was on the phone and couldn't see her. Frankly, she was tired of nodding at family discussions in executive boardrooms and on boring dates. She was tired of being the archetypal strong black woman, impervious to vulnerability, pretending she didn't need a man's touch for years, had lost its luster. She was lonely. Brittany Ray, page 76. A week after the statement, bouquet arrived, another one was delivered. Brittany explained the second bouquet away, telling Jamal that Johnny was obsessed with her. Then, radio silence from Johnny for three weeks until a dozen light pink roses were delivered to their town home with a note that read, I'm coming to see you, Johnny. That was Jamal's breaking point. That evening, Brittany sat on the edge of their bed next to a crumpled piece of damp tissue. She had blown her nose, wiped her tears, rinsed and repeated that action as Jamal started pulling clothes off hangers and shoving them into two large suitcases he'd flung onto the floor. Every time she tried calling his name, she was silenced with a hand held up to her face. Stop, this hand said. Just stop. This is too much, Jamal mumbled to himself as he moved from closet to suitcase and back. Jamal, she called out. That one business card you just couldn't throw away, huh? He stopped in front of her. I don't know him. I googled the b Jamal caught his breath. He collects black women like trophies. Did you know that? Huh, Brit? I swear to you, she cried out. I don't know him like that. Then why does he keep sending you goddamn flowers? What the f is he apologizing for? For being an a Brittany wanted to scream. But she couldn't tell Jamal. She had agreed to that dinner. She had been complicit in the derailment of their relationship and she had no one else to blame jamal hadn't deserved any of this i'm so sorry why him what why him huh jamal was furious he stormed around the bed and planted himself in front of her baby don't be like that she cried as he cut her off is it because he's white what so he can protect you he continued can he open doors I can't? Jamal's stunning words propelled Brittany onto her feet as she tried to reach for him, but he grabbed her by the wrist to hold her back. Brittany, he started, his voice beginning to give way. I deserve the truth. End of first passage.
That was a passage from In Every Mirror, She's Black. And Lola Akimade Akostrom is in the studio. <laughs> yes. All right. So powerful passages there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So the journey into this book can't have been easy. Mm. Searching for the right emotions, the right words. How long did it take you to put this together? So from crafting the characters to actually writing the book, it took about nine to 10 months. Okay. And that's for the dirty drafts. Mm. Obviously, once you have that, then it goes through the editorial process. Mm. But yeah, it took about nine to 10 months to actually get the first manuscript out, mm. the first version of it. So there are three key women in this book. Yes. Three women, three different stories. Do they ever meet any at any point somewhere in there? They actually do meet. Um, oh, okay. I, I really wanted to kind of tackle class, career, and culture. And so I knew right away I needed three very distinct characters to address it, each of those themes. Mm. So Kemi addresses career, you know, Brittany, class, and then Mm. Muna, who is the Somali refugee culture. And so they do meet, but they meet in ways that are very organic because they're also strangers. Fantastic. Now, I'm already drawn into this piece. I'm already pulled in, sucked in. I have a feeling I'm going to have a nice you know, curl up in a corner (laughs) with my coffee kind of read with this piece. Um, But it's not easy to get to that place where you're telling a story that feels real and connects, especially since they're three different characters. Is any of the characters you? So I always say that none of the characters are me, but also all of the characters are me, right? Because as a black woman, I can relate to a lot of the different emotions Mm -hmm. that they've kind of gone through or that they struggle with. And With this book, I knew that the book I was meant to write at this stage of my life was a lot closer to my experiences, to the people I've met, to the inspirations. Mm. And so that was why this book kind of came easily. Okay. You know, it's a really raw, open and honest book, but it's not based on my life. It's kind of inspired by lots of different, you know, experiences. Okay. So, so who is this book for? Um, so when I say, who is it for, is there, did you have a particular audience in mind? Was it about demographic? Was it about age group? Was it about sex? Was it about race? So the book, Muna, Brittany and Kemia span different ages. So it actually speaks to lots of people in different demographics. So Muna is really young. Uh, Kemi is in her mid thirties. Brittany is kind of early getting into her forties, but the book is for both. Black women and non-black people as well. Because for black people, we want to be seen, right? And we want our stories to be told as honestly as possible without being hidden behind kind Mm. of flowery prose. Like Mm. this is what we go through. These are the microaggressions we face. And then for white people or non-black, I wanted them to see it in a way that was unfiltered. Okay. So you can kind of connect like, oh my goodness, Mm. these are the same emotions that I feel, except I have the privilege of my skin. Mm. So yeah, Mm. absolutely. Okay. So let's talk a bit about the cover page. We see different types of women on the cover with dark skin. And then of course you look into the title. So where was your mind when you were picking both the cover and the title for the book? Absolutely. So the the title of the book was actually, it came as a collaboration between me and the publisher because okay. the initial working title wasn't enough to capture kind of the full spirit of the book. Mm. The initial title was called Afro Sweet, okay. but I felt like that was, it wasn't capturing the fullness of mm. what the book mm. was trying to, to say. And mm. so we kind of coming up with different titles and testing with different readers. This was the one that connected the most to it. Mm. And then with the cover, I just gave out my thoughts to the designer, uh, Kimberly Glider. I said, Mm. you know, I'm thinking about women. These are their Mm. ages. Mm. This is, these are the characters. And then she goes and then creates this amazing cover Mm. almost on the first try, you know? Mm. Mm. And, and so you can see it's three women. Yeah. So it's Kemi, Mona Mm. and Okay. But they're all blending into each other (laughs) because society doesn't see them as unique individuals. They see them as just, they're just all black women. Mm. So their experiences are all the same. So let's talk about the fact that you use Sweden. Now, I believe you live there. Yes. You live there. So Sweden and Europe generally, if it's not UK or maybe France or Italy, not a lot of Africans tend to connect with 
what happens in countries such as Sweden, uh, Belgium, possibly even uh, the Netherlands. Yes. You know, there are some countries that you just can't really connect with. Were you worried about that? Were you worried that, you know, once people read the word Sweden, they're like, okay, what does Sweden really do? Correct. You know, if, <laughs> if you had said Switzerland, yes. everybody thinks of Switzerland as the home for cheese, home for chocolate, home for money. The UN. No? Uh, yes. The UN, <laughs> exactly. So, so talk to us a bit about that. No, absolutely. So Sweden is still a very kind of mysterious place for a lot of people. Mm. And it's also a very kind of powerful country in terms of being a, an advocate for human rights globally, right? Okay. And it's a great place. You know, I call it my home. You know, I've lived there for 11 years now. But at the same time, Sweden is not one dimensional, right? So it's not just meatballs and Volvo and mm. blondes. Okay. It's actually very multi-diverse, multicultural. Mm. And I'm a black woman living in a predominantly white society. So it was okay. very important to share this voice because okay. the voices are also very valid. Mm. And the racism and the microaggressions we experience, very similar to the U.S., except in the U.S., you mm. speak about things in public. Okay. In Sweden, not so much. Wow. Not so much. So, okay. and, and it's cultural, right? Mm. So this was, it was very important for me to show that no matter where you are, that we still go through a lot of these kind of shared experiences mm. as well. Okay, so let's talk about these experiences now because your characters being uh, from different corners of different divides, they also had backstories. Uh, so let's talk about how you went into your research for their backstories. I men I can see here that it's mentioned that uh, one of them um, was a flight attendant, yes. right? Did you have to do any research on that? <laughs> did you have to go into their backgrounds? What did you do? Absolutely, I did do a lot of research. You know, I also... You know, I work as a travel writer as well. I've traveled a lot. I, my beat is experiencing culture through mm. tradition, lifestyle. And so I usually go deeper. Mm. And so, first of all, with the book, before this, I wrote a book called Logum, The Swedish Secret of Living Well, okay. which kind of demystifies the Swedish mindset around okay. this ethos. Okay. So I'm coming with a lot of deep mm. cultural experience. Okay. Now, with Muna, who is mm. a refugee, I spent a lot of time at an asylum center as a photographer, oh, working wow. with a lot of uh, refugees that came in, mm. more as a personal project to give them back the photos, not so okay. much to exhibit, okay. but to spend time to say, look, you being a refugee does not define you as a person. I see you. Mm. Your name is Kazim. Here is a photo of an amazing, handsome man. Mm. There is your photo, right? And okay. so we're spending time and doing that. Mm. And so I met a lot of people like Mona. Mm. And, and so being a travel writer that writes a lot about Sweden, saying come visit, come visit, which mm. you should come visit. Mm -hmm. I'm also experiencing this other side and I needed to also share those voices. Equally okay. important as well. Uh, let's talk about uh, the acclaim. That's uh, how it's been received yes. uh, in different parts of the world. I'm not sure where it's been released yet. Which which countries have you released it in? So it's uh, in the U.S., okay. now in West Africa, okay. North America, and then in the U.K. and Commonwealth countries okay. next okay. week. So okay. And then we've signed a German publisher. Amazing. And we're also getting a lot of foreign interest. Mm. So it's resonating mm. globally. What, and it's just the beginning. What's the most interesting thought you've heard from someone who's uh, been through your book? So there have been so many kind of reviews, but I think one of the reviews that really stuck out, and it was from a reader, is like, this character felt so real that she mm. felt like she was reading a biography of three different women. Okay. And I think for me, that was the point for, for these women to be seen as fully fleshed individuals that that you feel for can relate to you know and so that was one of the kind of reader responses, responses. that really resonated yes all right then um so there must be a dream for this book where do you see this going what do you think will be the peak the pinnacle for you with this book i won't say like a pinnacle i just mm -hmm. wanted to be in the hands of a lot of people because for me my purpose is creating cultural understanding creating mm -hmm. bridges of understanding and if I can do that in a way that makes you feel, that makes you kind of have empathy mm. on the other side, then it kind of brings us closer. And the book is raw. It's honest. It's unflinching. Mm. 
Hmm. And for us to get closer, we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? And so for me, that's for the book to get into the hands of as many people as possible so we can see each other more. All right, then. Now, I have to say a big thank you to you because I understand how much pressure it must be on tour uh, with your book released in different areas of the world. And you've come to talk to us about this piece. For you that are just tuning in now, it's called In Every Mirror, She's Black. And I'm going to take another passage now before we wrap up on the On Air Book Club. In Every Mirror, She's Black. Written by Lola Akimade Akastrom. Page 197. Muna. As read by Titilayo Oyinso. Why shouldn't I fire you? Yagis was furious. Huh, Muna? Yagis was back in their apartment an hour later, sitting in an armchair facing the grey sofa where Muna and Kajija were parked and their hands on their laps. Khadija was fiddling with her fingers while Muna just stared at Yagis, simmering with quiet anger. Yasmin stood behind his chair, resting a hand on it, looking down at the floor. The Turk was livid. He'd woken up with a throbbing head in the hallway when two Somali teenagers had kicked him awake and ran off cackling after pointing at his still rigid penis. Realizing he was naked and finding his clothes out there with him, he quickly dressed himself and pounded his way back into their apartment. While fighting off both Khadija and Muna, Yasmin had managed to open the door and let him back in against their will. Once back inside, he recounted his embarrassment to them, trying to prod guilt out of their trio. The two seated women regarded him in silence. Then Muna broke it. What were you doing to Yasmin? She asked him. What we do is none of your business. She was screaming, Muna said, adamant for an answer. As women do when they're enjoying it, he silenced her. But you can't know, can you, right? Yasmin told me you're a virgin. He cocked his head upward to look at Yasmin, who was standing behind him. Right, Yas? He tried, garnering support from her. She glanced away. He snickered under his breath. I'm not stupid, Muna continued. You are hurting Yasmin. She's not talking because she's afraid of you. Yagi scrutinized her through dark eyes. I'm not afraid of you, Muna added. Yagis laughed. A large smile spread over his handsome face. His handlebar moustache dancing. Maybe you should be afraid of me, Muna Sahid. His laugh died into a frown. You should be afraid. You work for me. Muna felt quiet. She needed this job. She needed to have a record of responsibility so she could become a citizen in a few years. She craved that security. Holding that small book would mean she finally belonged somewhere safe, a place where she could start rebuilding a family. Mr. Bion at the Migration Verket had intimated that it was unlikely she would become a fully accepted Swede. At the time, she hadn't been sure if he meant before or after getting her citizenship in five years. After living in Tensa for a while, she began to realize that Mr. Bion had meant. She replied him, saying her culture was too strong to be fully accepted. Dead air hung around the foursome. Yasmin was shifting her weight nervously from foot to foot while Khadija had switched to examining her fingernails, not wanting to meet Yagi's rage head on. Khadija kept toying with her fingers, but Muna noticed her trying to hold back tears. She recognized that expression. Muna herself had worn a similar one for weeks after Ahmed died, shedding it in the safety of her room. The only time she cried publicly was on the first day she met these women whom she now considered her sisters. Muna turned to Yagis once more. Why do you bring it to our community? Bring what? Cat. The sack of leaves, a chewable stimulant they had found in Yasmin's room, 
one of the Somali communities in the suburbs had been marred by its effects. Even her tensor, even her tensor wasn't spared. Whenever she followed Khadija to the community center to hang with other Somalis, she watched some of the older men drowsily mill around. Swedish media had focused heavily on the cat epidemic within their community because apparently chewed by immigrants was less forgivable than cocaine sniffed by Ostermalm's upper class whites. Why are you selling this here? Why are you destroying my people? End of second passage. And that was the second passage from uh, Every Mirror She's Black. It's a beautiful novel and uh, the lovely lady Lola Akinwadi Akastrom is still in the studio. Honestly, I think it's a powerful powerful piece Thank and um, I'm definitely going to take a lot of time going through this cover to cover. Now, any final thoughts for the young reader mm. who comes across your book? Where would you like them to go and how would you like them to receive it? Well, what I'll tell them is this book was rejected over 70 times. Wow. Right? So the manuscript for this novel was rejected over 70 times, which means always stick with your voice. Okay. If you know what you want to write, if you know your story, the world is going to want you to change it, to turn yourself down to to conform in a certain way. Mm. Don't, right? Because the right person that connects with that voice is going to come along and then you're going to find the community that comes along. So stay, keep writing, okay? you know, and stay true to your own unique voice. Thank you so much for that. And with that, we're wrapping it up on the On Air Book Club podcast for today. For those of you out there who would like to reach out to us, we are at the On Air Book Club on Instagram. And of course, I'm at TT the Dynamite. Uh, you can visit at in every mirror on Instagram to find out more and uh, possibly be part of one of their upcoming events. And uh, for more on our book club, you should visit Africa business uh, where everywhere we're on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and of course at Africa biz radio on Twitter. We appreciate everyone out there listening right now. And uh, until next time, keep reading. <laughs>